Huh? Yeah. Makes sense. Okay, you can hear me. Okay, so welcome back to second day of Academy. <laughs> I hope you had a wonderful evening yesterday and could enjoy some great food. And we start the second day with a keynote from Leonardo Favario, who is a, um, a government official from the Italian presidency. And he will speak to us about uh, Developers Italia and the work that they have been doing to bring more open source at the government. Thank you, Leonardo. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes, no, maybe? Yeah, cool. All right, welcome everyone. Um, in the last couple of days I was thinking about how to communicate uh, in this short amount of time whatever we have been doing in the past, let's say, three years. And um, I wanted to focus mainly on these three points, let's say, three topics. Community, legal framework, and catalog. Now, I know that we, um, we are developers, so we don't speak legalese, so we don't want I don't want to bore you with too much about the central uh, legal framework, so I will be very, very quick about that, but I'd like to talk to you about that since I think that Italy is quite advanced in this sense. First and foremost, who are we and what are we doing? Um, I like and we like to define us as a startup in the government, okay? So we are a bunch of folks, like 30 to 35 people, um, let's say focus on, we have a background in different uh, fields from software architecture, software development to free and open source software. And, and we say that we are building the operating system of the country. What does it mean? Um, government, the governments in general are complex machines, uh, but in order to digitally transform a country, uh, we need to have uh, some solid foundations. So uh, we need to have the digital infrastructure in place before thinking about how to uh, build layers on top. So this is exactly what we are focusing on. Um, we call them the enabling platforms. And uh, for example, those are like the national resident uh, register. They are like the um, digital identity. They are the digital payments. And of course, um, when we started to think about how to implement these um, ideas and put them in actions, um, we said, all right, we don't just need technology. We need to involve the citizens as much as possible. And that's exactly why we built communities around them. We have a community called Designers Italia, which is focusing on um, writing and developing guidelines uh, for templates for all the public services. We have Developers Italia, and that's the focus of my talk, which is focusing on how to um, get people involved. So how to get developers involved, how to get citizens uh, involved, give feedback and uh, open issues and so on, and how to, of course, get public administrators, first of all, understand what we're doing and then contribute. So uh, let's start with the first topic, which is which I like to call community. Uh, developers Italia is uh, the community of public service developers. And uh, I like to say that we are like th 3,000 developers. Even if we are not exactly all developers, we like to treat uh, everyone in the same way. So um, what's the particular point, I would say, the one of the most fundamental one is that Everything the dig Italian digital team and everything uh, we are pushing the public administration to develop is 100% free and open source. And we'll see how the legal framework is helping us in, uh, in order to accomplish um, this, uh, this target, let's say. So uh, I know and we all know that numbers are not a real indicator of how communities are uh, exactly performing and now and we, we heard really good speeches uh, yesterday however just to give you a, a quick uh, look see of uh, the situation we have 250 open source repositories um, uh, mo nearly 3,000 users in, in our um, chat channels uh, we and they exchanged like 35,000 messages last month it was vacation month so in Italy so you, you may think that 
Uh, this is not a, a huge peak. However, something is happening. It's uh, in, an interaction among these players is happening on our channels. And um, I'd like also to focus on uh, the hackathon that in uh, October uh, 2017 was run uh, by uh, our team. Um, and I think uh, that this was a way to get people to know what we were doing, okay? So uh, putting 800 developers in 26 cities, also San Francisco was connected live uh, on the same weekend in order to develop and work and understand how public services had, had to be uh, um, you know, designed and developed and, and tested was a great opportunity for us to uh, understand what people wanted, what citizens wanted, what public administration, uh, administrators wanted, involve also uh, little, uh, small to medium enterprises, and then you know, grow the, co the overall community. So you may say, okay, you're talking about communities. Uh, but what are you providing those uh, folks? What, what is uh, the objective of your community and, and what are you talking about? Okay, so Developers Italia, and you can browse it, developers.italia.it, is what we call a developer portal. So we were focusing mainly on, on two things. The first one is uh, a platforms uh, catalog, let's say. So uh, I was uh, mentioning before the um, the work of the team uh, that is um, working on the enabling platforms. So as I told before, digital identity, digital payments, and so on. But we said, okay, we are developers, so we kind of know what we need, okay? So we don't just need uh, some sort of blog posts and um, you know, rough documentation. We need something more. We need technical rules. We need uh, to have access to a whole set of SDKs written in different languages for different frameworks. We need also maybe graphic resources, okay? So that if we need to implement uh, a web application using um, some sort of uh, interface, it has to be a template uh, sort of standard in order to uh, let the citizen have uh, the, the best experience possible. And also we need to test, okay? So, as you can see, I quickly showed you uh, what um, the digital um, identity page on our uh, web portal has. So, it, all, it has all these sort of uh, objects and it um, allows uh, developers to quickly access it. This is the first part. And then the second part that in our developer portal we are um, stressing is the API selection. So, of course, um, if we want to interact with public services with some sort of uh, web application somewhere, we need to have APIs in order also, first of all, to test and then to understand if uh, the code we're writing is actually uh, performing uh, the, the operation we want. So how do we find APIs? In Italy, it's, in Italy sorry, it's, it's not so straightforward. So we said, okay, let's prepare a web page where we uh, show a selection of all the REST APIs and then we help public administrators to write um, Open API 3 specs and, and we help them write documentation in order to have, again, a standardized way to interact with them. Okay, so what are we providing to uh, the community? We have um, a GitHub account where we are storing, as you can see, uh, most of our uh, of our code or where people can actually um, become maintainers since we want to involve the community so if sw someone is doing a great job it's, it's some private citizen it's some freelancer also if a, a, a small medium enterprise is doing a great job uh, on a piece of software then it's okay they can become a maintainer and we are stressing this we want to involve as much as possible people to get uh, connected uh, to the code. All right, code without documentation is quite um, hard to grasp. It's quite, it's not so straightforward to understand. So um, one of the th first things that the, the team decided to do was to implement a documentation platform. So this is Docs Italia and is our response to that is based on read the docs. Uh, with a template um, made in a, in, a standard, uh, in a standardized way uh, using the uh, designer's guidelines. 
And then at some point we said, okay, this is cool, but let, let me think about it. Um, we're just storing documentation. Why don't we just try to experiment something new and put also loads on top of this platform? If you think about it, a low is something, or you know, a technical uh, document um, derived from a low, is nothing else than a document that evolves over time. So we're using to use Git every day, to use version control, to get diff on some a piece of code. Why don't we just try to do it on, on the lows as well, okay, on our legislation? So we started uh, drafting and putting as much information as we could on top of this platform, and right now citizens can easily just browse uh, the load they're looking for and see the different versions, see who made a, a modification where and uh, how it did change and so on and on. And we're using this platform, stressing its use also for um, when, a, when a low is getting, it's in the process of getting published, so we want to um, involve citizens in the decision, so people can comment on this platform, they can, uh, you know, open uh, merge or pull requests, they can do all sort of things that we are used to do in software development, but uh, maybe, uh, and it can be, uh, of course, uh, applicable also in, in the field of uh, a simple text as a law is, but it has never been done before. Um, of course, other tools that we are uh, providing to our community are um, meeting points. So an, an async way is using a forum that is based on discourse, and um, it's incredible how uh, people are actually appreciating it. Pr uh, private citizens are appreciating this uh, platform, and they are not only discussing about our um, platforms, our software, the ones that we are doing at Developers Italia, at uh, the digital transformation team, but they're talking about every kind of service that is available to private citizens. And this is something uh, again, maybe it's quite trivial for us because we are all used to um, bulletins and, and forums and, and chats, but it's something that is quite, uh, let's say, uh, revolutionary in, in a government. And people are using it as well. And then, of course, we, are, we have a um, Slack channel, but we are also evaluating other possibilities um, for letting people uh, communicate in real time and uh, in, in a chat fashion. Okay, so this is uh, the, the background, let's say, uh, what Developer Italia was uh, up until uh, a few months ago, uh, but then something started to change, something started to improve, and then I want to, is, again, <laughs> without boring you too much, uh, introduce you to the uh, new legislation framework uh, in, in, the, in Italy. So, okay, um, Italy has um, an interesting uh, set of laws for what regards uh, digital administration, and they are all um, grouped inside what is called the digital administration code, and that's, that's Italian law. And it's interesting because two articles in this um, code, Article 68 and 69, are um, totally in uh, direction of free and open source software. Why? Well, because those two articles say they a public administration, in order to, uh, in the phase, in acquisition phase, so when they need to acquire a new software, uh, they have to go uh, free and open source by default, okay? So the first pick has to be free and open source. And just if they cannot find um, a, a free and open source solution developed by other public administration or developed by third parties, like we could be, uh, private citizens, then they can, you know, uh, we will see how, they can um, sign uh, an analysis where they state that there was nothing provided and then they can start developing uh, their own uh, code. If they develop their own code from scratch, then okay, that code has to be 100% free and open source. Okay, so uh, it has to um, have a uh, free and open source license, has to be uh, published on some sort of uh, code version and si uh, version system, and um, it has to be available for the whole um, other citizens. So this law was um, already had already been crafted when the digital transformation team came uh, to be. However, uh, it was hard to interpret it. So it was hard to really understand how uh, those passages were ha had, to, had to be done. So a, a normal public administration didn't know 
exactly how to publish a piece of code, how to uh, interact with other administration in order to get uh, um, a piece of code and, uh, and get it to work. So that's why the team in the past three years worked on these new guidelines and the name guidelines looks like yet another piece of document. However, right now they are low, so they are mandatory by law. And these guidelines, I believe, are a, a really good opportunity for a public administrator to understand how this process works. So these are practical guidelines and that mm, tell everything from how to start an, a, a project in an open fashion by default, how to manage, uh, how to maintain um, a repository, how to um, you know, deal with uh, merge or pull requests, uh, to upstream from other um, contributors, and so on and on. And the cool stuff, I believe, is that um, those, these guidelines contain um, some technical attachments, we call it that way, that you can basically copy and paste them inside um, a contract you're making uh, to a third party developer. So that even if the developer doesn't know how to do that, well, it's the public administration in the contract itself, it's specifying what the developer has to do in order to go open by default, okay? So um, this is something um, I believe quite revolutionary because it's, again, it's basically a mandatory by law that um, the public administration has to go open by, de by default. So again, as I told you before, um, this guideline tell a PA to um, make a comparative assessment. If you don't find a uh, free and open source so software in our catalog, and we'll see what the catalog is, then you have to sign a piece of paper where you say, okay, this software doesn't exist, I have to develop it, but then when developing it, I have to go open by default. Um, yes, that's it. But just to cl clarify, to Quick example, development phase and let's say reuse phase. Let's call it that way. So um, let's start in this uh, little um, um, blue ellipse <laughs> over here. So we have public administration A that uh, for some reason had made the uh, comparative assessment and decides that uh, there's no uh, free and open source software available uh, and it has to develop a new one. So what, I, what it means, uh, okay, PAA, starting from here, um, drafts a contract and commissions the development to the developer. In this uh, contract, it's written, again, uh, taken uh, from some of the attachment of the guidelines and put it in the contract, it's written that uh, that piece of software, whenever it's done, um, the ownership of that piece of software ad has to be assigned to the PA, okay? So the PA um, commissions the development of software. Uh, that software, whenever it's finished, the, uh, the ownership of that software goes back to the PA. And then at that point, the PA uh, can do basically two things. One is publish that code it, by itself, or the second one is ask the developer to publish it. Usually, the, what happens is that you put it in the contract that one of the uh, last thing to do is to uh, ensure that that code is uh, being uh, published on SOP or some co public code hosting platform, okay? And then what happens? Well, um, automatically, and we'll see how, uh, this uh, code is being indexed into our uh, Developer Italia catalog so that our uh, other public administration can directly draw from it, okay, and see um, and make use of it, take advantage of it, okay? So that was the development phase. Let's see the reuse phase. Again, we'll start from public administration B this time, okay, uh, down here. So public administration B, first thing is uh, that, uh, that the public administration has to do is to search for that software search for any kind of software on top of the, our platform, on top of our catalog. If there is a hit, let's say, what happens? Okay, public administration B tests it. Uh, it the public administration has to see if that software is really fitting the requirements and their needs. Probably, and this is happening many times, what happens is that um, 
probably uh, the administration B needs some customization, needs to have some modification and so on. So again, public administration B appoints a developer to do those, um, those customization. The ownership of those customization goes back to the public administration. And then again, as we saw before, that code developed goes, uh, goes directly on top of a code hosting platform, is re-indexed by our um, catalog, is shown again so that the an imaginary public administration C could see the first Imago software and then also the modifications, okay? So that um, it's um, more um, immediate and transparent way of handling uh, public administration code. Okay, so we saw community, the community part. We saw this short, uh, let's say, uh, resume of the uh, legal framework. And now we see where this information is actually stored, where it is indexed. And uh, I mentioned before the catalog, the Developers Italia platform. Uh, what is the catalog? What are we talking about when, when we're dealing with the catalog? So um, I told before, Developers Italia was a developer portal. It had platforms, it had APIs. Right now, starting in June, we also have another section, and if you browse the, the, the the side, which is also translated in English, you can uh, easily see it. And this new section is called um, software. Okay, it's called software catalog. So again, one of the questions I was asked, uh, like I don't know, ta tons and uh, like thousands of times, when I was trying to um, talk with public administrators, like PA managers, like uh, people who uh, you know managers who take decisions and who. Uh, actually decide if um, a software has to be developed from scratch or it has to, uh, you know, reused in some way. One of the first questions they made me, they made me, was where do I find those information? Where do I find that piece of software? And it, again, thinking in a developer fashion, it's kind of trivial. So, cause what what do we do? We just browse some sort of um, website. We query some. Uh, uh, search engine, we ask some friends, we just ask the community, and in a way or another, we are able to more or less understand which are uh, the softwares that may fit our needs, or which are a set of libraries that we could use, okay? But this is not so straightforward, for example, when dealing with public administration. So we decided that we had to build a catalog, and, and actually this catalog is uh, mandata mandatory by law right now, and uh, in the lows I was, uh, was telling you before. And um, what this catalog is, is basically, um, again, a container of all these uh, uh, information regarding a software. So you can see over here, it's uh, quite light, but um, every, every software uh, has a dedicated page. You can um, see the information on the page, information regarding, I don't know, features or the roadmap or, uh, of course, screenshots of, or you can also see the tree of forks, okay? So that you can understand uh, what, which is the original fork that originated the other ones, or if there's a fork that has been maintained more than another one. You can see who are the maintainers, okay? Which is quite, quite important, and if there is a contract right now. So, for example, again, think about the, the example before. So if public administration A was is right now paying a contractor in order to maintain that software, then public administration B can take advantage of that and doesn't have to pay another time to maintain the same piece of software. Or maybe they can, you know, join forces and uh, let make that software become a little bit more uh, featureful or, you know, better maintained and, and tested. And then there, and then there we also inserted uh, a sort of index, uh, we call it uh, vitality index, which is a combination, there's an algorithm uh, that is basically uh, taking into consideration all the activity, all the activities that are going on onto a certain uh, repository and it's showing some a sort of vitality in order to help the administrators. Of course the catalog uh, has, uh, is indexed, uh, we have a recommendation system in order to, you know, uh, help in the, in the um, searching phase, we have um, a cloud of tags and so on, and you can see over here that um, in the first, I would say, month, an, a month and a half, let's say 60 days, two months, 
uh, we already collected like 42, 45 solutions. So, and this has been, um, even without us, even without the t digital team going there and asking uh, for contributions, the public administrations, just reading the guidelines, reading the laws, understood that this is mandatory. So right now, from now on, they have to go open by default. So what they did, they created, if they didn't have one, a, um, an, an organization on top of a, a code hosting platform, and they um, inserted all the information on top of that in order to be registered in our catalog and uh, be indexed. You may ask, okay, but how do you get all this data? How do you get information regarding, um, I don't know, where the, okay, where the, uh, who is maintaining the software, which platforms is the software made for, um, who is using the software, okay? Which are the public administration using the software? So that's how we crafted and why we crafted a specification let's say a metadata specification called public code, the YML, and um, in which is sort of, you may say, okay, there are a lot of uh, specification standards over there. However, there's not a real one for uh, what concerns public administration. So this standard is exactly uh, targeting public administration software we use, and um, we have been crafting it in a way so that uh, both developers and uh, managers, so, uh, you know, um, decision makers can actually take advantage of this code. Of course, it's YAML, so it's easy to write, easy to read. However, in order to further help our administration, we, we created an editor, which is basically, you know, um, which is what you get, basically, uh, forms that you, you can, um, you can fill. And then what, what is the output of this editor? You're creating that public code, the YML file, you're downloading it, and the only thing you have to do in order to be indexed in our catalog is to put that public code, the YML file, in the root of your repository, okay? So this is actually the actions that the um, public administration did. They created a public code, they crafted one exactly with the specification of their software, they downloaded it, they put it in on the, on the root, uh, in the root of the repository that they owned, and that every night automatically our um, crawler crawls uh, all the, um, the public code hosting uh, or the on-premises that, uh, that you're installing for yourself on your own organization, and automatically extracts information from uh, this public code YML file and populates your um, web page and indexes that page into uh, the, uh, our catalog. So, you know, it's, it's really straightforward, it's really trivial. Okay, I've been talking just about public administration, maybe a little bit boring. However, I'd like to, again, I think this is a clear call to action right now. Since, um, Public administrations right now, with this new legislation, are doing anything, um, anything, let's say, fantastic or extraordinary. They're just, you know, uh, following whatever we are used to do when developing free and open source software. They're just opening a repo, uh, using um, free and open source license, and then, you know, continuing the, develop and the development in the open. So that's why in the catalog, um, apart from the public administration reuse part, there's also another part that we call third-party open source software. And in that part, it's basically, um, that part is basically open to anyone. So any one of you uh, developing uh, free and open source software, uh, or you know, uh, if you find also a piece of software that may be of interest of a public administration, well, you can create a public code or YML file, put it in that repo with some uh, easy uh, pull or merge request, and that's how immediately uh, the night after the, the crawler will crawl that information uh, and will publish that software on top of the catalog. So we see how if we make this uh, catalog alive, we, we make it as active as possible, we publish as many information as possible, and so this means as many software as possible, this means that public administrations, when they have to 
uh, acquire new software, the first thing, and this is mandatory by law, that they have to do is to go on that catalog to check if that software is already there. And the law mandates that if that information, that software is there, then they have to pick it. Okay? So I believe this is uh, what I call a promotion. Okay? So use the catalog as a showcase for your software. In order to let public administration know that your software is there, your software is awesome, and your software is actually able to solve their problems. And if it's not, well, they can take it and maybe, you know, get in contact with you and get a contract with you in order to uh, further develop it and reach the status um, that they want it to be. So, okay, of course, this is just a little step, you may say. Uh, wh where is this revolution, right? So, um, this is just a little step, but I believe it's a, just, I don't know, a giant leap forward for public administrations. Because um, it's, it has been hard for them and for governments to find exactly the software they were looking for. And that has been sort of a scamotage in order to develop software from scratch or, you know, get so software, maybe proprietary software with um, incredible uh, licenses just because they were not able to find one. So the, the, le the legislation is on our side right now. We have the catalog, we have the instruments and the tools in order to make the catalog alive and to populate it. And um, it, this is a way so that, the, so that we have to um, let public administration understand that this is, has to be the default. Is, it's right now mandated by law, but it will eventually become the default. Of course, this is a little step. We don't want just them to publish the software when it's released. We are in this outreach phase, the digital transformation team is telling everyone how to handle a software and be uh, a software development and be open by design, okay? So from the very first step, you have to go open, involve the community, uh, listen to the feedback of your citizens, which are actually the users of your software, and in this way, make it as much interoperable as possible. Thank you. Any questions? Hey, thanks for the presentations. I ha and I have two small two questions. Number uh, one is that are there any security audit conducted by 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 independent parties on the open source code? And number two is that are there any kind of bug bounty programs for the um, for the for the open source codes? All right. Should we pick other questions or? Yeah, maybe I can. Yeah, thank you for your question. Very interesting one. Um, yes, so I would say right now the code is out there. Um, so what we are telling public administrations is like, hey, watch out. You don't have to just download that um, repo, clone the repo and just Docker compose up, okay? Um, you, in the first phase, what you need to do is to uh, probably appoint or contract a, um, developer or a, as you said, some auditors uh, that will carry on and, you know, uh, do some auditing process on top of that piece of software. So that um, you have to understand that also from a security perspective, uh, someone reviewed that code, you know, someone actually um, tested that code, someone did some SAST or DAST, you know, some sort of analysis on that code. So that's exactly what we're telling the public administration. It's not exactly self-service, okay? So, okay, the code is there, but it's also your repositories are there, okay? So, uh, but uh, however, when we talk to public administration, we say, okay, that's there, but uh, please run a, um, a um, security analysis on top of that. However, what we are implementing right now is exactly in this direction. So we would like to give public administrations that want to pick, or in the acquisition phase, let's say, uh, an indication, so running uh, from our side on, on the digital transformation team, uh, some security analysis, um, I don't know, also container uh, uh, testing and so on. Um, we want to give them an overview of what's the state of the, uh, the security of that, of that software. 
Regarding bug bounty programs, um, okay, we are aware of like uh, the European Union one, like the FOSA project, and um, it's we are in the process of defining how to do this. It's exactly what we would like to do. Uh, I think it's uh, personally, I think it's a it's a good uh, approach. However, we need to define how to how to go in this direction. Um, I have a question. Yep. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I've noticed that you have documentation both in English and uh, uh, in Italian. Uh, so the first question is, what is your working language? And second question is, who writes your documentation? Okay, cool, thank you. Um, yes, good question. So we, we try to go English by default uh, in since for a lot of many different reasons. I mean, also because when when you know dealing with developers, we, we all kind of know English, and um, so that is not a real you know obstacle. However, um, since we're Italian government, we have to of course provide also Italian documentation. So we, we try to have both for most of the projects. Um, regarding who writes the documentation, we have a team of tech writers, um, with, which is uh, quite active and they have a lot of interaction with the developers. So yes, where we can, we use tech writers in order to write documentation, especially for what I told you, uh, are the enabling platforms where, you know, good documentation really is needed. So we try to uh, make use of their knowledge in writing documentation as much as possible for those. Where we cannot, we try to, you know, uh, follow templates. So the designers team made uh, documenta uh, documentation guidelines. I don't even know uh, the exact name. However, um, it's a guidelines on how to um, to write proper documentation, and we are following it in our our, our projects. And the fact is that we are telling public administrators to use it as well. Okay, so it's um, it's a cycle, and it, it looks like it's working right now. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. So what about code quality, as in um, what kind of measures are we going to be put in place to guarantee a certain amount of quality? Uh, I work in the sector and I can give an example. So mm -hmm. software A doesn't exist yet. A procurement will be created and a big company will come by, bid the lowest, they'll get the job, make, you know, write as much as necessary to actually yeah. you know, pass t quality test, uh, not quality test, sorry, uh, functional <laughs> tests. Yep. and you know, ship whatever mess that is. Then functionality B needs to be done, another yeah. procurement, another big company uh, bids the lowest, monkey patch it until it works, yep, yep. and that goes back in the... Yeah, the, good question. Um, of course, there are a limited amount of things that you can do in this way, but if you sort of um, define which are some sort of thresholds uh, in the contract itself, then, you know, people start to uh, work in different fashion. <laughs> so, um, and that's the direction where the guidelines are, uh, went. So, as I told you before, the guidelines have these attachments that can be copy-pasted into a contract. And most of the attachments are in exactly trying to solve this problem. So they are uh, asking for, for example, uh, when you, you just don't push the master, right? Or you just try to use a uh, code review process. Uh, you try to um, involve as, as many other people as possible. But you know what we saw that uh, in many occasions uh, this happened in the past where people were used to develop in a closed fashion. So they, are, they had their own SVN or Git somewhere and so they said, oh, okay, who cares? I just push there and then whenever it's finished I'll, I'll just ship my code. When working in the open this is slowly changing um, so we are, for example, uh, helping uh, public administrations to understand maybe uh, also how to, I don't know, run uh, pre-ooks uh, for, for um, before pushing or to check whether uh, you're storing, um, you know, passphrases or certificates or any kind of sen sensible information into the, into the repository we're trying to help in order to avoid it. So all of this, I'm telling you, it's already inside the guidelines, so it, it will be attached to the contract, to the contracts that you are giving your, um, your developer. So, you know, when it's a contract, it's, it's more, 
let's say, um, it's hard to, to, to avoid it. And if you do avoid that, uh, then there may be consequences, of course. So it, we are trying to go exactly in that direction in order to avoid whatever we saw up until now uh, happening every day, in order to avoid it seeing in the future as well. Yeah. So basically, the contractors they do the lowest possible and whatever mess, and then ship that. But no, nobody sees it. If all those code that is developed uh, is in the open, it by default starts to make it better, even with no actions taken. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I feel the same, and that's exactly the last slide, right? So that's why we are pushing. Uh, uh, public administrators to tell their developers and their contractors to go open by default, okay? So from the very first moment, and not just push as a, as a last, the last commit and push it in the open. Yes. Uh, if I also may add a comment, in the procurement process, okay. you can see it's actually a very good advantage to remain maintainer of the software you have created. So there is a good incentive for companies to do the right thing because it's going to be less expensive also for them. In the long run, and they're able to get many more contracts. And Leonardo, have you ever thought about uh, building up uh, something like a trust pilot uh, for citizen with speed uh, so you know who is going to yeah. give a feedback? Uh, and so maybe the, uh, when a public administration chooses a software and the citizen is happy, Maybe you collect the feedback, so maybe the software is good uh, as well as the service. I don't know how exactly, yeah, 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 it's just you. an idea. I got a question. Uh, I can say that in some project of the Italian the digital transformation team, this is happening. So we have, um, we have a way to get direct feedback from, uh, let's say, beta testers or, uh, let's say, early stage users. And, um, however, we are thinking about how to implement it and scale it also for other, uh, for other projects, like you said, the uh, digital identity is one uh, candidate. And uh, yes, we think that, again, in this is not our software. This is, it has to be as transparent as possible. It's a, a public software. It's for, for, for citizens. They, they are the users. So we have to collect feedback as much as possible in order to iterate over that and, and release and ship better code. Okay, I have two questions for you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, when did it all started? Uh, and second, uh, have you experienced any resistance from the big IT companies lobby? Okay, cool question, thanks. Um, easy one. <laughs> okay, um, okay, so that's the curious thing, so um, the uh, the digital administration code has been out for quite a while. Uh, so the new part is these new guidelines, which again, they're called guidelines, but formally they are, they are low, they're mandatory. And uh, they have been, I mean, the team started to draft those guidelines in 2016, 2017, and they have been uh, published uh, on May this year, in 2019. So this is really fresh, this is new. Um, Regarding the second question, um, as a team, uh, we, we are in contact with a lot of providers, uh, with a lot of, again, small to medium enterprises, but also big enterprises. And um, we, I, thi I think uh, we were more afraid of, you know, of having to deal with situation than what really is happening in reality. It's like, uh, it looks like people are sort of understanding that this is a law, so they cannot really uh, escape it so easily. And so they are re-engineering or rearranging their uh, the development flow in order to comply with the law. So I would say, yes, that was the scary part, of course. And, um, but we have to know, and we know that resistance will happen every day, however, we, we already put it in place, um, countermeasures, countermeasures. So we know how to handle with this situation, we know how to reply, we know how to, which, you know, which document to point or uh, which law to refer to. Even if, you know, it's, uh, it's legalese, so uh, for developers it's quite hard to do this work. However, we are 
for, for the moment, we are handling the situation quite well. So I, I'll be happy to report you back in a year and hopefully everything will be open. Yeah, I have uh, two questions. Yep. Uh, the first one is, uh, you said you had put the laws now on the Git as well. Have you had any interest from lawmakers to actually use Git to help them write laws? And secondly, is there or could there be any uh, cooperation with other countries in Europe for the public uh, administration software? Oh, I'm not quite sure I got the second one. Oh, uh, if, um, say they have uh, IT systems in Germany or Norway. Okay, or yeah. Can you share the same software and okay. cooperate on it? Well, okay. So um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, first question is um, yes. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, first of all, of course, we need to um, involve a team of tech writers in order to uh, help lawmakers uh, publish it. I know it's just MD or, you know, Markdown or RST, so it's not so complicated. However, it's, you know, you're changing the way they're trying to, they're, they're cut. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's not so straightforward. So that's why we uh, basically use these, uh, the guidelines we wrote and also uh, human interfaces. So people, actually tech writers, in order to help this transition to happen. Uh, but this is really cool, I think. It's, it's a way to really see the changes and, um, and, and many new uh, documents, many new laws are gone, are, are docsital by default. Okay, so they're already uh, written in that way, in that format, and using that technology by default. And the second one, uh, it's an interesting question, uh, since I would say definitely yes, since at the end of, the t at the end of the pre this, all of the discussion, the software is nothing else than a, any kind of repository with an open source license. So the, the contract itself between a public, an Italian public administration and a German one it's just a license. So if you're using, you know, any, any, any GPL license or any license you want that is in the OSI list, then why not, right? And, and this is exactly the direction where we're going. So this is not an Italian, you know, little way of handling reuse and it has to be just Italian. It's open source. So it's free and open source. So just that's, of course, which is the way to use it. Um, probably can be our catalog. Since our catalog is both in Italian and English, uh, that's also a way to, um, you know, probably spread it around and we are in, in contact with different um, governments. In, in the also, yeah, all, mostly in the European Union, but also, uh, let's say, outside, in order to understand how to, you know, um, work on this specification, on the public YML specification, sorry for that. There you go and um, develop it further and then use the catalog, why not? It's already there, of course it's free as an open source, if they want you can implement their own, but if they want to use ours, that's cool. That's it. Okay, thank, thank you. you. If anyone has any queries, please ask Leonardo in person. Yeah, I'll be here all day. So. Yeah, okay, thank you Good Leonardo for that amazing talk. Thank you.